Welcome to the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Treadwell. Our mission with this podcast is simple, to help you build your business and to do mortgage marketing better. Success in any business is determined in large part by our ability to learn new things. So we're here to share firsthand experience and advice from some of the most sought after experts in the mortgage industry. I'm so excited that you've joined us and I hope you enjoy the episode. All right, welcome to the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Treadwell. Mortgage Marketing Expert is a proud founding member of Industry Syndicate Podcast Network. Our Mortgage Marketing Expert today is Brian Covey. Uh, He grew up in Memphis and uh, had a love for the sport of soccer. Uh, He ended up competing at high levels, uh, was a professional athlete, traveled the world, and uh, is now currently the regional vice president uh, with Loan Depot, which is a top five lender. Uh, He's super passionate about being part of uh, championship teams, equipping his teams to to excel, and uh, as well as leadership development and and leading change in the industry. Uh, He has a podcast uh, called The Brian Covey Show, and uh, he is recently uh, publishing a book called Conversations with Covey. And uh, super excited about this. He's, he's also part of the, the Forbes Real Estate Council and, and does a lot for our industry and uh, has become a great friend of mine over the last couple of years. Brian, super excited to have you on the podcast, my friend. It felt long time coming. And thank you. This has been one I've been looking forward to. And I know we collaborate a lot of, high, a lot of times behind the scenes. Yeah, man. Be cool is to share some of that with your audience. You gotta- For sure. Well, I'm, I'm glad to have you as well. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll go into people's backgrounds and, and things like that, uh, but I want to skip that because I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of getting into the meat of it. And and you and I, uh, we do collaborate a lot and have a lot of conversations. And uh, yesterday we we kind of started talking about some things in the industry. So we got some of the the initial, hey, how's it going? Haven't talked to you in a, in a, a couple of weeks or a couple of months out of the way. So let's just kind of jump right in. Man, we are in unprecedented times in the mortgage industry. And uh, everybody knows about, you know, companies, you know, doubled and and 3X their production over the last year. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. But one of the topics that I think is super important to talk about that that you and I kind of left on a little bit yesterday was our industry has got a little bit of a short-term memory, right? Things are good. People are fat and happy. There's low-hanging fruit. But we have forgotten that, you know, end of 2018, early 2019, there was a lot of folks that were hurting. There was some cash flow issues that that term no one likes to talk about of quote unquote margin compression. And so I kind of just wanted to start there. Like, what do you what do you foresee in 2021? What are some things that people need to be mindful of so that, you know, history doesn't repeat itself? Yeah. And I think you know, we were talking about that and we do have a short term memory because I think that could be good and bad for us, right? So let's kind of take that context of sometimes it's good because in our industry, we do have so many highs and so many lows where even when rates change in a week and you see loan officers just gravitate to that and whether it's rates dropping, they feel great. Whether rates go up quarter basis point, 50 basis points, and they think the world's crashing, right? I think that's a big swing. We were talking about that with our leadership team the other day and where rates were and what was happening with margin compression and what we saw. And we know many companies actually just not that long ago, two years ago, we're not profitable. And we know that there was consolidation coming. And I think it really just kind of set that on the sideline because we were given a gift in 2020 in many ways I saw was that we had record volume. We all know that, right? So we were able to serve more customers. We were able to help people refinance, help them buy their home. People were fleeing outside of normal home life to figure out like, I work from home. My home needs to look different. And we had a slogan, home is everything. And we talk about that. So that really drove a lot of people wanting to buy. And that took us into now 2021. So you still have loan officers working from home. You have real estate agents many times not going into the office. You have customers buying homes. And we're seeing in many markets, inventory is extremely low. And we think that will continue this year. That's going to be a hurdle. We need to kind of figure out what do we do around that. But then you start looking at, you have families forming as well, right? And we know this right now through COVID and through staying at home. We know we're going to have a surge and we're already seeing that. So as families expand, what happens? They need a larger home. So this year, what we're seeing is a very fast start, but I don't want people to have the head fake of the fast start. I don't think is how it's going to finish this year. What I mean by that is there's going to be a season that we come out of, could be four months, could be six months to where rates normalize, right? And if the Fed keeps helping out, I think that'll be something that keeps rates relatively low. And if we use relatively in terms of two years, five years, 10 years, Rates are phenomenal. But what could happen with inventory being low is how many buyers end up not finding a home and just 
take themselves out of the process. That could happen. And then you also have refinances, which we know they're going to have to slow down. At some point, everyone that's refinanced in the twos or below, you start taking a segment out, but a $10 trillion market still provides opportunity if we show up and we look for where those opportunities are. And a couple of areas I'll just say, you know, Phil, I see the opportunities are still new construction. Mm-hmm. I think home builders are going to continue to surge. They're going to have an opportunity with land position to build homes, affordable homes, but also custom homes. So everything in between, you're not thinking about new construction. That's an area I know we're leaning into. The second one would be renovation. When you think about people today, they may not need to move, but they need to upgrade their home. Kitchen, bathrooms, add-on bedrooms, pools, all of that is an area that I think we can serve our customers and help them out. And the third is going to continue to be relocation. I see that as a trend that's going to happen. So staying connected with your customers and making sure whatever your strategy is and lending in multiple states to be there and let your customers know that you can provide for them. So if they move from Texas to Tennessee or vice versa, can you be their loan officer and guide them through the process? Because I do see people as work from home becomes more of a normal thing. Mm-hmm. People can choose where they want to live in the country, not just in a particular market. So high level, that's what we see happening. And, and that's where we're focusing our team. So as people continue to work for home, uh, work from home rather, and we get used to as an industry being a group of people that work from home, what do you think are are going to be company strategies to capitalize on that? So that again, I, I don't want to make the topic of conversation uh, margin compression, but in a lowering rate environment, margins are plentiful. In an increasing rate environment, a lot of companies tend to race for the bottom, which tightens those margins, and there's. Not enough. And a lot of times the, the default is we're going to cut LO comp or we're going to cut support staff or whatever else. Yeah. Um, because we're having this situation where instead of having to house 100 people or 10 people in a physical office space, maybe they have a location that has a signing room, a meeting room, and a, and a day office or two for people to come in. What are some strategies that you think companies will use both tangibly and intangibly, consumer facing and internally to, uh, you know, uh, create some efficiencies. So I think this could be a struggle for, for many companies as, as you and I talk to people at other companies quite often, and whether they're in mortgage or real estate, I think there's some, some overlap that's happening there. You have this first camp that still is a little bit tied to, whether, whether they want to admit it or not, they're tied to this office and in existence to have brick and mortar. And some of the companies I believe that maybe have too much real estate, commercial real estate on their books, they're choosing to invest in real estate as a standalone opportunity, right? You mentioned some other things of staffing and and pricing and margin and marketing and all those things. I think the best modern leaders today in the way that we're approaching it is a little different than that. And it is, we're running a business just like anyone else will be running a business. You need to look at all of your costs and your revenue and where is your strategy align up with. For us, for example, we don't need a lot of offices. We're realizing customers are very comfortable going onto their mobile device from their home, on their couch, And they will apply online and that process digitally has become much easier. So we don't necessarily need the the same amount of space because loan officers are not coming into that space very regularly. So a couple of things we've done that I'll share because some of this is is higher level. Let's get into some of the like actually what I believe should be happening. And one of those is you should have a studio in some of your offices in your market, right? So I live in Nashville, Tennessee. One of those markets we've actually created in the, the branch there in Nashville, we created a podcast studio. You can actually film, you can have your real estate agents come in. And then we have another room in there that you actually could have customers come in. That's a smaller conference room. They could sign at their closing. You could have the title companies in there. You could do conferences together. We use Zoom, you know, all the different services there. We have the big screen. So you could have a smaller group. And then we have what I would call common area. And it's almost like if you walked into an Apple store, right? So you walk in in the mall and you've seen the Apple stores and you have these little stand up desks. And you could have five or six people plug into those. They can come in, plug in, work for a little bit, and leave. So they'll be able to connect with folks. They'll be able to create content. And they'll also be able to do things like closings. And I think, Phil, that's what I'm saying is I'm still hearing some people connected. They they really have this identity tied to being in an office. And while I see that's important to connect with each other in the team, some of that has changed, right? And I know people on the team that are not wanting to come back to an office. They actually are thanking us that, we're not making them come to an office every day. <laughs> if they're more productive, they get more time with their family, they can travel more and they can do some things they love. And I think that's the integration of life and what modern life and origination should look like and will continue to look like. 
And I love that you say that because we both of us have talked about it in both at our current companies and previous companies have always been big advocates of allowing people to work remote, especially support staff roles. What what I find and, and, and we agreed on was that you end up getting more productivity out of people, not less, right? Because they work when they can. They have the flexibility of if they want to be gone to quote unquote travel on vacation for a couple of weeks, they can still be plugged in and work and still have that you know vacation time. But this new concept of of these offices and things, it's interesting because uh, the company that I'm with, Thrive Mortgage, we have the same thing. I didn't even realize it until after I'd come on board. Four of our offices across the country have full-on podcast studios that have lighting and uh, you know soundboards and microphones set up. And one of them that I thought was really cool, it has a connector on, on from the board that's a lightning plug that'll go straight into an iPhone or iPad. So you can just set the camera up right there, click record, have record an entire video, audio quality, and everything, and just, just unplug it and roll. And, and I, I, I say that to say... There's a lot of companies doing things like that. You know, you and your team are, are definitely one of them, but it's changing the dynamic of why offices are there, right? We're, we're inviting referral partners. We're inviting people from the community in to utilize these resources. Another little area that has, you know, a couple of seats with some microphones overhead for kind of a, a fireside chat type recording. We have some green screens. All of those things are changing from Cube City, where we force people to work there that don't want to be there in artificial air, to these community type resources that people can come in and participate. And I know that you're big on this type of thing, you know, from, from a community standpoint and from a, a culture development standpoint. And I'd love for you to kind of, whether it's, you know, in, in the context of these spaces or just in general, I'd love to kind of hear some more of your thoughts on how the industry is changing in that way. Yeah. So this is what I think is we've started to figure out is, is think about support staff. So kind of move away from the originator because I think this is where it's often overlooked in our industry. And it's a group, you and I, like we have friends, I have folks that have been with me at multiple companies and they're the ones behind the scenes that don't always get their voice heard or opinions. And I've been asking them about work from home. And if you were to ask them in priority, they're probably in that role, not because of the money, right? Because you could make more as an originator. And we all know if you do the math and if you're a good salesperson, you can go generate business. They, they might go that route. Typically, they're very service-oriented. They're very caring. They want to provide a service. They like to be part of a team, but they don't always want to be in the spotlight. And that's typically why they've gone into those roles. What's interesting is that then they want to be with their family more. They want to travel more. There's things that they're passionate about. And what I've learned just listening to our team is this has given them an absolute opportunity to recreate their role, right? Not just thinking about money, not just thinking about what they do when they're away from their job, time off, there's some integration where they can show up to their kids' sports game in the afternoon and not feel bad about leaving the office, going home, and that commute time has been taken away. And we were at a soccer game last night. One of our best processors in the entire um, region, she actually has her daughter on the same team with me, right? And so we're talking and looking. And I just thought it was so cool that we're able to go do those things in the context. And she was sharing with me. She's like, Ryan, it's great. I can work from my laptop. You know, we're looking at going to Disney for spring break. And I can plug in if I want during certain hours, but I can be removed if I want to be with my daughters. And I'm thinking, that's something I think we all need to be mindful of because we need to make sure the culture breeds that. Um, not necessarily that we're, we're out there saying, just go take vacations, travel the world. But if you hire the right people and you give them opportunities to do things they love, they're going to be more apt to give you more during the hours they're serving and working with you. And I think that's where, back to your question about productivity, that's where we're starting to realize, how do you actually maximize productivity today in a way that's fun and engaging and gets the desired business outcome that we all are trying to achieve? And, and I love it because it's not a one size fits all. And we're able to now, I feel like as a leader, take care of the team in a way that in the past, it was very much go to an office. This is how it's done. If you're in ops, go to a big building you know, do that. I think we've broken down some corporate barriers that we didn't even know existed. And I love that. And I agree. I think that the, the, I call it the, we workification of our office space. So most people want community spaces, people want, you know, coffee machines and, and uh, to be able to, to grab a glass of wine or a beer at happy hour, if they, if they want to, you know, they, they want to have some culture and some employee experience. And I, I recently did a, an episode with Scott Harris, the CEO of Social Survey, which is now experience.com. And he, he gave me an interesting stat. He said, we believe that two thirds of CX 
is driven by EX, right? Giving a good employee experience by default is most of the way there for your customer experience. I think that's exactly what you were saying a second ago is not only the productivity, but people want to perform because they like what they do in the context that's relevant to them. Oh, man. That is it. So think about it this way. And I always look, we are the brand in the market, right? And we talk about this a lot is we are the brand. So for Loan Depot, when somebody works with one of our loan officers or processors or production assistants, myself, whoever it is, we are the brand in that moment. That's the experience they get. And we all know if you're happier and more bought into what's happening because you're enjoying the team you're around, your leader is giving you flexibility to get the work done, maybe within the, the hours and what you do, you are going to work harder and smarter and be just a better representative. And that's where we have found, let's lean in on that because they joined us for a reason. We want to make sure they stay with us for a reason and they grow with us. And, and you're, just, you're spot on, Phil. I, mean, I think that's where the cultures will thrive and there'll be some cultures that get left behind. Um, but we want to be part of those just like you do, that we help the industry move forward, not just our team. I think that's, that's cool, right? We're going to do that. But I, I would love to be an advocate for the industry is how do we move cultures forward so whatever company you're at, like you can do the same things we're doing. It just takes, it takes a mindset shift for most people. It really does. The, the industry that we're in has been one that uh, we all know is, is historically been an aging industry or has been an, an older average age. It's one that's not adopted in integrated technology as well as a lot of other verticals. And we're now finding that because there's a huge opportunity in mortgage and real estate in, in the broader category, especially on the residential side, that we're not only attracting really bright talent, that with them, they're coming with fresh ideas of, of how we can more modernize or, or make our industry more relevant and things of that nature. And I love that you say that because you and I are both very, very passionate about moving this industry forward, not for the purposes of forgetting who we are or getting away from the fundamentals of, of what it means to be a, a very quality mortgage professional, but to make it relevant and, and similar to what else is going on in the, in the in, or in other industries. And I, I say that to say you're also very passionate about personal development and you've in, brought up a, a ton of great leaders that are all friends of mine and, and you're very big on not just the professional side of your life, but the mental, the physical, the spiritual, the emotional sides of that. I'd love for you to talk about that for a minute because you've got a really cool philosophy and you've, you've developed some, some really great leaders and loyal team. And I'd just love for you to kind of share your thoughts around that and how that ties into what we're talking about. And so this could be a long time. So I'll narrow it down <laughs> and I'll kind of tie it in is, is I really, you know, growing up, we all have lessons we've learned as an athlete. You know, I learned a lot of things. When you get knocked down, you get back up, you learn your resiliency, you learn commitment and discipline. You learn that coaches matter. You learn that being part of a great team can make you better than any individual on their own. And you have some of these foundations you take with you. And you know, over my journey of this is my 20th year actually in mortgage is I've started to apply those lessons more and more over the years into how we build our teams. And I look back, great Dr. Stephen Covey, right? And he talked about the whole person theory. And so I think about each person, right? We kind of have the mind, the spirit, the body, and all this together that we work with. And, and sometimes we forget about the whole person and we're just attacking one area or the other. I think that's where we have taken a, a strategy of if we develop people personally and professionally, you have a much bigger impact on their life. And so some things we've done is we encourage coaching. We encourage mentorships. I will help you find the people. And I believe as a leader, one thing I've done that I look back, I wish I had done sooner is I've intentionally sought out mentors and coaches of my own that I can then introduce to our team. Because if I'm not leading it and walking what I say, I believe, then it, it's just not true, right? There's a, a gap in there. And so that's been a pursuit of mine. I shared a story yesterday on LinkedIn. It was probably similar to many in the industry. 2008 crashed and burned. My job got eliminated. Had two kids under two, living in a different state, had no family there, had to pack up everything, basically start from zero, like literally zero um, and move. And to get out of Florida was everything we had. And then to start over. And I look at that and that was kind of a lesson for me to realize it starts from inside of us. And so what I want to do, and I believe great leaders are doing right now is what's inside of Phil, what's inside of Brian, that greatness that we can bring out. And so we try to bring in not only mortgage coaches and things that are going to help you technically become a better mortgage professional, but how do we bring in people that will help you? I believe there's a huge correlation between your physical and mental side of the game and how you perform and show up at work and how you show up at home as a dad, you know, mom, spouse, all of those things. So we've connected all those and our team understands 
we're accepting the whole person in and we're going to work with you on the whole person that you are. And I will say this, you know, Phil, if you go on the journey as a leader and you lead with that and they see that, it's hard for it not to be contagious. And then I've always shared this last belief of, I wanted to be part of a team that leaders created other leaders, that created other leaders, that created other leaders, generational leadership, not just me taking care of the team that reports directly to me. We want to create more leaders for the future. That's going to change this industry. And I'm so fired up about that because there's people raising their hands like, I want to be part of that. I've never seen this before. This is different. And that's the journey we want to invite them on. Do you think that leadership is something where you have to have a certain amount of innate talent or gift and then develop skills around that? Or do you think leadership is something that can be taught to anyone? So I would tend to go on the latter. Um, and here's why, as I've seen people in my life, me included, that there were things inside of me I didn't know existed. It took someone to come along and encourage those to come out to um, instill a little bit of confidence that maybe I was lacking in that moment, right? And as we moved up, I think about the younger Brian in my 20s that I was given a leadership opportunity and, and I had no idea what I was doing, right? Top producer gets promoted, no idea. Um, I think it can be learned. And what I would say is, as you're learning and going on your journey, be the leader that you were created to be, not the leader that you see out there and you go, man, I love what they do. I'm just going to emulate what they do. And when I got very comfortable in that several years ago, you can kind of see my trajectory changed. And those that are very close to me saw that and it was taken off the suit, right? So you could see physical things that happened, but mentally there was a shift in how I approached everything in my life. And I started to realize like God gave Brian certain innate like knowledge, skills, experiences in life. Those are the things I should be sharing. That's where I should lead from my heart there and connect with my head. And so I would say that that's the leadership journey that can be learned. And I'm an example of it is you don't always get it right. Um, you're going to fall down sometimes. You're not, you're not going to always be the leader you aspire to be. But if you go on the journey and every day you're trying to become the best version of yourself, you're, you're going to be better than you were if you just sat on the sideline. Man, that's a great answer. And I didn't, I didn't really have an agenda in that. It just something that popped into my head. But, you know, Rene Rodriguez is a great friend of mine. I know he's a, he's a good friend of yours as well. And he talks a lot about that leadership is influence. If you're trying to lead and no one's following, you're just taking a walk. I know that that's a, a famous quote out there. But what I, what I want to, this is a, an interesting segue in this, this conversation, because what I want people to catch in that is that if you're in, we're all influencing people, either positively or negatively. So we're all leaders naturally, right? There, there's probably a more formalization of it, but I think you're exactly right. We're all going to influence people. So how do we as people in the context of what we're trying to accomplish in our lives, how do we put effort and discipline and practice and failure uh, behind that so that we can learn from it. And so uh, that's another great topic because I know that you're, you're passionate about this kind of stuff like I am. Let's talk about failure for a minute yeah. because I'm very adamant about uh, formal education in, in academia, if you will, is very different than education as a broad sense because I'm very pro-education. My mom was a teacher for a long time. I have my own qualms with formalized academia because I believe that it teaches people that if you fail over and over and over and over and over, yet still learn what happened and why and learn that, that you can't still win. When in the real world, in my opinion, that's exactly the formula is you're going to screw up a bunch, learn what happened and why, and that creates the skill set that you, by default, if you're still trying, um, can, can succeed. So let's talk about failure for a minute because there, there are some people that may experience this in this coming year or two as our market shifts, what is your take on that? How do you coach your team on those types of things? Yeah, one, be aware that it happens to everybody. And I think when you're prepared for it, and I go back to in sports, we would actually do visualization, right? And my dad's a psychologist, so I was very fortunate as I learned some um, kind of mind tricks in a way and things to tap into just my subconscious and my conscious and all that there. I think if you visualize things that will happen and visualize something that doesn't go well and how you're going to respond, and you can program your brain, right? Like Tony Robbins talks about this and some of the, the greats out there. And what I've learned is if I'm aware that that can happen, then I'm prepared for how I'm going to respond. And I can shorten the window of what happens typically in failure as we go through the cycle of we're kind of embarrassed. We, we beat ourselves up. We're like, why did this happen to me? 
Sometimes we'll blame other people, right? We won't take ownership of it. And that cycle's vicious because if you allow that cycle to continue for a day, two days, a week, you're living in the past and you're, you're basically holding back from your greatness and sharing where you are. And what I learned with these kind of setbacks, I call them, failure, obstacles, whatever people may want to coin them as, the quicker you can realize that's it, what's the lesson I'm trying to be taught in this? How do I move forward and immediately move into action? If you can shorten that window, and for you today, if that's, you know, it takes you a couple of days to get over things that don't go your way, can you shorten that in half to a day? Can you shorten that if you do in a day? Can you shorten that to give yourself two hours, go through the emotions, back on track? That's what I've learned in real life that works for me is things are going to happen. I've prepared my mind for them. I've programmed a response for how I'm going to respond. And so, you know, feel like nothing really comes as a surprise when you, when you work your mind as a muscle like that. I think that's where you need to be prepared as, as loan officers, like speak to the audience, a lot of them that follow, like a customer tells you they've gone with another lender. Do you sit around for the rest of the day and tell your coworkers and everybody the story and just mull in that sorrow? Or do you say, you know what? Cool. What am I going to do next? And if you can respond quicker, you're going to find success is going to come to you at much higher levels. And the, the successful people, it's not that they have less failures. They just know how to respond and they move on to the next thing. Do you remember the first time you were really deep in a file as a loan officer and they said no. Do you? I, I remember my very first one because I was absolutely devastated. Do you remember the first time someone absolutely told you no? Yeah, it's actually a friend of mine. Um, and and I remember, and it was one of those, and I was still new, you know, learning the ropes and all that stuff. And it was like, what do you mean no? You're my friend. I'm your friend. <laughs> like, how's this work? And um, yeah, you, you learn. But uh, at that point, I was not dealing with things you know, maturity comes sometimes later with experience. <laughs> you know, I was very young and I've told the story on the podcast of how I got in the industry and, and the the dynamics around that, but I'll never forget. It was it, the first five customers, you know, the first few, we had done the application, we had signed disclosures. I had the approval. We were in processing. We may have even started ordering appraisal and title. I mean, we were pretty deep. I, we'd locked the, the interest rate and they went with their local bank just at the last minute, not because of better rate, which she told me is, I know you're new in the business and we just don't want anything to happen. And I was devastated. I was just so frustrated. Like I'd done everything right. Yeah. There was nothing then, you know, I already had this little stigma because I was young in the business and come to find out the next year she was, because I told you my mom was a teacher. She was her teacher aide the very next year and found, because at that point I, I'd had a little more success in the business and she knew my parents, she knew my family, she knew everything but I learned a valuable lesson that day, two things. One, sometimes you can do everything right and you're still not going to succeed, if you will. And the yeah. second thing is I never took the time to develop a relationship with that person. It was a small town. She knew my family. She knew my parents. All I had to do was ask them any questions about their life and then let them ask me about anything about my life. And there was about five different ways that I could have created that connection that would have salvaged that deal so I think there's a lesson in there for people. Don't spend as much time selling, start talking about relationships. And that's kind of where I want to take this because you're really good at developing relationships with people and you've got a lot of respect and admiration of people in the industry. And I'd love you to kind of talk about your evolution in that. Because like you said, we we all mature in different ways. We all you know kind of evolve in this business and none of us are, are great at it to, at the beginning. But what's that journey been like for you? Man, so you know, I've shared a lot about social for me was a way to... Um, learn a lot about myself, but also connect with people. And I think innately we have this desire for all of us. We want to, we want to connect. And what I realized, and this kind of goes back to my dad being a psychologist and kind of thinking through some things I'd learned is people want to be validated and social as it started to take off several years ago. I've been on LinkedIn a long time, um, Instagram a few years and all that. I started to realize there was a way for me to connect up with more people actually on a deeper level, because you think about like in your day and in my day, how many people can you or I actually speak to in a day, build a relationship like you just talked about and not surface level, like ask some questions, actually have time to listen. How many real estate agents can you actually get in front of given today? Maybe you get in front of a big group, but how do you really connect deeply with them? So one of the strategies I deployed, which anyone could do today, it's free. Um, and it's one of the best that has worked for me is I saw someone like yourself that I wanted to build a relationship with. I would go online connect with them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and all that. 
And I would start following what they posted. And if we aligned up and I saw, you know what, I really like what Phil's posting. I would go on and instead of leaving the generic, cheesy, um, pretty inauthentic comment of great post, awesome job. I thought, well, what if I did something different? What if I went in there and said, Phil, man, I love how you shared your you know, experience with someone that said no to you. And I've been there too. That's a great lesson. I think that's something we should share with other people. Well, you're going to feel more validated. You're going to feel like Brian actually cared. I didn't just send you a generic, you know, um, auto populated response. And so I started to build relationships that way. And what I would find is people would reciprocate and they would go, Brian, hey, do you want to catch up for a 15 minute call? Yeah. So you build relationships. So I would tell you that was the strategy that, that I have deployed. And it has worked not only, you know, obviously in my role, we're trying to attract the best talent to our team, people that fit us and do that. We also want real estate agents to find out who we are. And I looked at it as I'm building my brand in a different way. And I wanted to, I didn't know at the time, but I wanted to stand out for who I was and let people get to know me without maybe even having a phone call with me. And what a cool way to share who we are, what we believe. And then you're going to attract your tribe. So I would tell you, mm. that's, that's been, for me, the journey as it's gone through. And I've leaned in on that strategy. One I shared yesterday that, that I'll, I'll give this tip because it's worked well. And we both do the podcast. If somebody asked me, hey, how did you get this guest in particular? And I said, it took me about 90 days. I followed all their posts. And I intentionally went on and commented, like I talked about, with a real feedback and comment. And I was encouraging them and trying to add value to what they had put out there and give my insights as well. Say it louder for the people in the back. Right? Like, I mean, this was the way to build a relationship. And I never did an ask until we got to a point and they started then asking me questions and engaging with my content. And then I felt like, okay, now we've built a foundation of we like each other, right? It's almost like I'm back in dating. If they don't reciprocate and return your phone call or your text or talk to you, okay, you're not there yet, right? Mm -hmm. Like, got to build it. So I would say this is the same for business development, building relationships, building friendships and all that. And you know what? The cool thing is like, I'm having fun doing it. And now for, for guys like you and I, like I'm getting to meet some of the coolest people in the world. I'm not traveling as much as I used to, but I'm still feeling like I'm meeting great people that add value in my life. That Then I can take that out, what I learned, those lessons. I can distribute those lessons to our team and the greater industry. And I think that's what, you know, in many ways, that's what we were created to do. Man, that was so good. I challenge people to go back and listen, uh, you know, rewind a few minutes and listen to what everything he said, because there's a couple of things I want to point out. You built a personal brand by focusing on the person and not the brand. You focused on who you were, not just what you did, right? With people all the time, uh, real estate and mortgage. Hey, I, I want to want to get more traction on Instagram. You look down through and everything's just listed, just sold. I won this award. Look, you know. And uh, the third thing is you succeeded using social media by being social. For those that, that are listening, I'm, I'm kind of looking up at the ceiling here, kind of wondering what was so difficult about what Brian did. He has a huge following on social media. He has mad respect in the industry. He's an author. He's a podcaster. He has regions or a region bigger than probably 75 or 80% of all mortgage companies out there to begin with. And you did it by doing the most basic of things. And I, I say that with admiration because in, in, in a smaller part is exactly what I've done. You, you talk about podcast guests. Some of the people that it took me months to consistently connect with them, to engage with their content, or to just beg them <laughs> to come on are now some of my best friends to this day. Rene Rodriguez, I met him at Mastermind shortly after my podcast launched. I followed up with him, consumed his content for months. And he, he'll say now, he's like, I didn't really know who you were. Like I was just kind of, he, oh yeah, I wanted to come on. No, you didn't. You, you, were, you were trying to vet me out. And to this day is one of my closest friends and mentors, right? Todd Duncan's another example. I think I give him a hard time. I reached out for months and finally realized in the best way possible, the way for me to try to add value because he's very passionate about helping people. He's very passionate about sales mastery. I tried to help him with his his need, add value to him. And that's exactly the move that I got for Gary V. And, and I, I share that to say I 1000% agree with what you're saying. People are overcomplicating this. Build a personal brand by focusing on the person. Succeed at social media by being social. Focus on who you are, not just what you do. 
And all of a sudden you start connecting with people and having relationships and this business thing becomes very, very easy. Oh, and you've probably seen this too, Phil. Like, haven't you seen where you connect up with a couple of those people you, you talked about, they introduce you to their network, who introduce mm-hmm. you to their network. And it really is this snowball effect to where, I mean, I'm at the point now where I'm like having to plan out months in advance. And I thought when I launched the podcast, you know, let's be real. Like I had a handful of guests and I'm like, okay, I know these people will come on the show because they like me. Yep. Good start. And, and once you start doing this, it really is a way that you can exponentially grow your network in a way that's true to you. And, and I've just, i found most highly successful people love to give back. And so what you'll find is you start building those relationships and you truly are in it to add value to them. They're, they're going to help you in your journey. They're going to ask you, you know, what can I do to help you? I've had a couple people ask me lately and it's like, I don't know, but when something comes up, is that okay if I just reach back out? And, and it may be a five minute phone call that I just want to pick their brain or run something by them. And, and those are the relationships I think we sometimes undervalue and don't think about how that's going to help us personally and professionally grow. That's, that's a huge opportunity as the industry evolves. Love that. So uh, I've got a couple more things um, to two more questions. One, we're going to do a, a quick rapid fire round. I'll do this with everybody, but I think this will be fun with you. Um, so rapid fire round, um, just give me which of the two choices. First, uh, iPhone, Android. iPhone. Facebook or Instagram? Instagram. Uh, Instagram or YouTube? Instagram. YouTube or Facebook? Facebook right now. <laughs> Facebook or LinkedIn? Ooh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn or Instagram? Ooh, man, I knew you were going to get to this one. This is yeah. a tough one. Um, I'm going to go right now with LinkedIn because I've been on it longer and it has this unique opportunity, I feel like, that, that aligns up with just where I am in the season. Okay, reels or TikTok? Ooh, I'm enjoying some TikTok lately. <laughs> Love that. I always go there. It's that guilty pleasure that we all take a right turn on. Okay, um, now let's go uh, beach or mountains? Oh, beach. Ocean or lake? Ocean. Uh, staycation or travel? Travel. And there was one other question I was going to ask. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going I'm to save it this way. We're going to go ahead and go into the last one. I ask if you could just give one tip to mortgage professionals today to go out to use to build their business, what would it be? I think when we talked about social, I think it's still a sleeping giant. Mm-hmm. I think there is a vast majority of people that even if they're in the game, they're not actually in the game that's being played. They're, they're warming up and they're on the sideline warming up with other teammates and they don't realize there's another game happening. And I would encourage you to ask for help in that journey. Uh, Many of us that you see, and as I share some of the wisdom and lessons and things, were not just created by me sitting on a couch or chair by myself. I've interacted and collaborated at a high level, and I seek out people to help me in the journey, and then I can help them on their journey. And when you do that, you're you're going to grow your skills, you're going to grow your network, you're going to feel more fulfilled because you're helping someone else in the journey. And that tribe, as I talked about, continues to grow and give yourself a little bit of grace as it's going to take time. Like when you hear about some of these successes, know this is years in the making, but you need to start now because if you don't start now in four years, you're going to look back and go, oh, a few more people actually got into that game and I'm still sitting over here trying to warm up. Get in the game now. This is not changing. Customers going online at a higher rapid rate. Um, And I'll give you a stat here is in the fourth quarter, we actually moved up to the number two lender. And I had a friend of mine at Chase call me and he's like, what are you guys doing over there? It's not us as much as it's consumer behavior is changing. If you don't evolve and change with it in the industry, you're going to get left behind or you're not going to see the growth and your potential that could happen. So lean in on that. Man, that's a great piece of advice. Mm-hmm. Guys, I, wanna, I, I don't want to add to it because he said it perfectly, but uh, social media and marketing right now is a land grab. Everybody's pipelines are full. Everyone's still drunk from 2020. Uh, There's probably the biggest opportunity on social media specifically than there's been period, at least in mortgage and real estate. Awesome. Well, 
Brian, you've been an incredible guest. You're a great friend. I appreciate you taking the time. Go follow Brian on Instagram at the Brian Covey. Uh, go check out his website that we have in the show notes. Uh, listen to his podcast, buy his book. We'll have links to all this stuff. He's got a wealth of information. Uh, Brian, I appreciate you being on. I look forward to catch up again soon, my friend. Thank you, my friend, Phil. This is awesome. And I appreciate all you are doing as well, because together we're going to move the industry forward and continue to grow. Love that. Talk soon, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you heard something today to help you generate more leads, market yourself more effectively, or have an overall more efficient business. Please connect with us on social media to see our mortgage marketing tip of the day. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Mortgage Marketing Expert or on Twitter at Mortgage underscore MME. We have a lot of other amazing guests planned, so check out our other episodes and don't forget to subscribe to the Mortgage Marketing Expert Podcast. 